Live from the 2013 AES Show in New York City, Audio-Technica presents Ask Me Anything. And now, here's your host and moderator, Jeff Simcox. And here we are. Hello, everybody. All right, here we are with session number three today. Uh, a couple of things. Well, we have Frank Wells, the president of AES, here to talk to us and, and answer a few questions. Uh, everybody, come on into the booth. Come on. We are, we are streaming this on live stream, and it looks like the entire booth is empty, so it'd be nice to have a crowd, or at least a few people in the camera, so people online that are watching this, several hundred, by the way, can actually see that there's, there are people here. Um, okay, so I see some of you that, uh, that were here before. So as you know, in uh, people who answer questions here in the booth, or I'm sorry, ask questions, here in the booth, we'll uh, be in the running for a lovely, stylish, Audio-Technica branded tote bag. And uh, the winner will be chosen by the invisible person behind the wall who's watching us all on a, on a camera. Uh, for those of the people out uh, in the world tw uh, tweeting today, the favorite uh, question via Twitter will receive an ATH M50 headphone. And if you are here in the crowd and you want to tweet while you're here in the crowd, you are more than welcome to do so. Uh, the, the hashtag would be ATLiveAES. I believe it's up here for your convenience. Now, let's get on with it. Uh, we have with us today uh, Frank Wells as president of the Audio Engineering Society. Frank Wells has the distinct privilege of heading the world's only professional society devoted exclusively to audio technology. With 14,000 members in countries all over the world, AES unites audio engineers, creative artists, scientists, and students in its quest to promote advances in audio and disseminate new knowledge and research within the industry. In addition to his current position on the executive committee, Wells has been an AES member since 1992 and has held positions on numerous boards within the organization. In his professional life, Wells serves as editor of two highly regarded industry publications, Pro Audio Review, the only audio, or I'm sorry, the only American audio magazine to focus exclusively on the evaluation of professional grade studio and sound reinforcement products, and Pro Sound News, a monthly news journal dedicated to the business of the professional audio industry. Uh, a few things about Frank. What else have you done, Frank? Let's see. Oh, Frank, Frank was editor of uh, Audio Media for a long time. He has had a, done a stint in public radio as the chief engineer at a public radio station and was also chief of technical services at Masterphonics from 1983 or 82 to 1988. So all that being said, hopefully it was accurate. Uh, let's welcome Frank Wells. It was close. It was close. Yeah, yeah got a couple of dates there. Okay, so uh, I assume you're AES people. Any, any questions for the president? <laughs> I'll ask a question. All right. How's it going this year? Look around. I mean, it's going great. This, uh, this convention is, is really rocking. It's, it's, the aisles are hard to get through. I had to change aisles three times to get here because I couldn't come down the one I wanted to. And that's a beautiful thing. That means that uh, the energy for this show is, is up. The pre-registrations were up. We're actually kind of setting multi, gosh, records going back about five or six years have been have been bumped on this. So it's uh, it's a great feeling. Everybody seems to be happy. They're, the program is incredible. I mean, the depth of the program downstairs for um, all sorts of technical issues from broadcasting to live sound to post-production to archiving to student activities with basic tutorials to you know, you name it, if it's audio, it's being talked about in this building and it's incredibly rich and uh, there's, it's impossible to see it all. So yeah, I think it's going great. How about you? Are we doing okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, think it's, I think it's going pretty well. I've never actually been here before. This is my first year. I'm having a yeah. good time. Yep. You learning anything? No, no, I'm no? just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning a lot of stuff. It's cool, I got a, a sweet bag and I got a shirt. Bag of swag. Uh, yeah. A sweet lanyard. All right. It's going real well. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you. Great question. How about some other? Anybody else want to say? Oh, <laughs> oh God. here we go. Yes, ma'am. 
How do you feel the industry has changed in the last 20 years? In the last 20 years, wow. Or, well, we, ten, or 10 years. Or even 10 years. Yeah. You know, if we have an hour, we can just <laughs> we can just answer that one question for the next little bit. But um, the industry has changed phenomenally. Obviously, it's. Uh, the recording industry has dropped from being a brick and mortar institution only where you had to pay a million and a half bucks to play and to be competitive in it to where everybody can compete. The democratization of recording is, as everyone has, uh, has highly touted. But that also means that the gear purchasing chain has gone to retail. It's a different type of thing. Used to, you had to come to a show like this to see big consoles like SSL still showing next door. And that was the only tools that you had to do it. Now you can work inside a decent personal computer with a $100 DAW and you can be, do competitive work that way. So from the recording side, that's changed. Uh, the live sound side is still big business on touring. It's gotten more regional. There's more regional production going on than there has been in a while because people can't really fund themselves from the CD, the record sales, the album sales, that music channel is kind of dried up. So now artists to make a living are also making uh, more out of live performances. They're maybe selling some CDs from the stage, but that's been a boom in regional and, uh, and area live sound in television and post-production. The move to digital for, um, for DVD and then te television broadcast after that to 5.1 is the major generation of that has meant a complete revamping of every television station um, uh, stream of, of production flow uh, across the nation and such too so it's been a good boom time for television production from that point of view from from the folks who want to sell them gear uh, but a time of transition and the audio qualities there's never been better that's a short version yeah all right thank you how about any uh, another question from the house um, I s there, oh here we go what do you do, Frank, when, when you know or when you approach something? Maybe I, I say it in a different way. What do you think about the word impossible? The word impossible? Uh -huh. This is uh, just a uh, very... I, yeah. <laughs> what do you think about that word? Thanks, Frank. Well, you ought to make sure something... There, there are things that are impossible. I'm not going to stand up and fly. Um, from this end of the hall to the other. There's, there's things that I know we're not going to do. But certainly, um, you should really make sure something's impossible before you say no. You should figure out a way that you can attack it. Um, talk to people, learn. Talk to people who have tried to get there before. See what the goal is. I mean, if you, if you set your mind to something, I've, I've seen too many cases where, where things people thought couldn't be done or they couldn't feasibly do that uh, that someone else has turned around and done just because they said, well, I'm going to do it. They didn't say, they didn't ask the question, they just tried. And maybe they didn't hit the whole goal, but they, they got 80% there or 90% there and, and found out that was wonderful. So. All, right. All right. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. How about some more questions from the house? You guys are doing great. Thank you. Frank has a question over here. Uh, what uh, some advice, you know, it's great to see a lot of younger people here. Maybe not so great that I'm not one of them anymore. But um, if you wanted to get into the industry, either live sound or recording or any aspect of it, um, is there any advice or encouragement you might be able to give to people that are, you know, trying to get their foot in the door? It's, it's a different, again, a different world than where it was. There's the job opportunities as far as... Um, you know, the next Bob Clear Mountain and such, there's not a lot of demand for folks to fill those shoes. So we've got our, our, our leading guys who are doing that. However, there's more music being recorded than ever. Uh, people are just doing it in different ways and finding new ways to, uh, to make income and such from that. Live sound, again, the local and the regional has, uh, has, has grown more. Broadcasting has become more sophisticated. Attitude from my days working in the studio and dealing with interns that we had coming in, and from talking with people now that are that are hiring, none of this has changed. Attitude's still the most important thing. You can't teach it. Dan and I had this discussion a little uh, shortly ago because he runs intern programs for uh, Middleton State, State University, and we're talking about the people that are making a difference. There's a fundamental knowledge that they all bring to the table, but the ones who have the attitude that 
don't come in as know-it-alls, that come in willing to do anything that they need to do to succeed, that are willing to learn and, uh, and apply themselves. There's just that certain work, working attitude of turning it over to the facility. No ego on yourself is what I'm saying. You know, you're not pumping your own ego. You don't have to have the need to share your opinion. You're going to get asked your opinion when they're ready for when you've proven that your opinion is actually something they want. You don't volunteer that you think the snare sound is bad if you're assisting an engineer for the first time and, and, and he sat in the chair for 30 years, even if you're right. You don't answer that question that way. So that attitude was the, always the thing when, when we had interns coming in that set them apart one from the other, uh, the intangible attitude. You have to have the fun foundation of knowledge. You have to have the uh, the, the ability to work, but the, but the attitude you bring to the equation is the biggest thing. So you walk in with the right attitude. You, you tell people you're willing to do whatever it takes to get started in that business, and you show yourself and you prove that, and, and you'll succeed. Somewhere, somehow, it'll happen. All right. Thanks, Frank. Okay, well, a question that came along a little bit earlier on Twitter. What's involved in being AES president? Wow. I, officially, the job of AES president is to be the chief executive officer of the organization. Now, we have a nice bureaucracy, which is really good, actually, because there's a professional staff. Bob Moses, the executive director, who is uh, who's really the one that runs the society with his staff, which is a small small professional staff in New York. All of us on the board of governors and the executive committee are volunteers. So we have volunteered to put ourselves forward to end up in this position. But what we do is we set the foundation for um, the direction the society is going. We basically define Bob's job description, but I think the other thing that's important for us is we need to take the steps that are necessary to empower him to fulfill that direction. So where does the society go? How important are trade shows? What are uh, the various committees of the society focusing on? You're, as the president, I'm in charge of making sure the committee chair people are in place, nominating those committee chairs, giving them direction on the direction that they're wanting to go within the year that I'm, that I'm actually president. And then um, for three years as incoming president, president, and past president, we'll serve on the executive committee, and that's who the, uh, the executive director, Bob Moses, directly reports to. So we drive the society, we monitor the success, we focus the direction, and, uh, and hopefully we just empower the people that are there to, to have success and, and help them. All right, thank you. Uh, question from the House? Anybody? Okay, another one from online. How many uh, exhibitors are a part of AES this week? There are 300 plus exhibitors on the list this week. I don't remember the final count, but yeah. that's, it's on about a par with last year. The footprints that a lot of the companies, you know, not, not really significant companies like Audio-Technica, but other companies <laughs> are taking. Uh, the footprints are a little bit smaller on the floor plant, but it's, uh, it's still a healthy, a healthy show from the number of attendees. Is it the historical high? Well, well, no. You know, there's yeah. there's there's industry changes that have made a difference in that. But we have 300 people here on the show, and and, and a great deal of gear All right. for the attendees to see. Cool. Thank you. Check out. Thanks for the plug. Uh, okay, this one I think was Brent. Uh, oh boy. Thanks, Brent. Uh, Brent is asking, what what are your thoughts on pay what you want models for albums? Wow. If again, if you can have success doing that model and it and it funds you, that's great. I don't see it being um, a pay what you want model being something that's going to drive great success for putting money back into the system. The music industry system as a, as a whole, the record industry system has, has fallen apart. People have a general tendency to think of music as free. Um, if you've, they've proven to some degree, if you make it easy for them, they will still pay. People don't really mind paying a, a realistic fee. I think you're not going to see pay as you pay what you want as a fundamental model for every album that's or every product that's released. 
Um, I, I don't see it as being sustainable, but it's, but certainly it's a great gimmick. And uh, it's usually been used as a great gimmick and as a money maker by people who were going to sell albums anyway. Okay. All right, thanks. Anybody? Yeah. Since um, a lot of the um, idea behind audio, just, I just said before with your last question, how the idea of pay as you go is kind of like disappearing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of curious, is the idea of the album disappearing as well? Yeah. Um, obviously, from the way the download trends are going, it is moving towards singles to a single-driven industry again. There are a lot of artists who have embraced the concept of doing EPs, short nuns, you know, two or three songs, four songs per per bit, and doing those three, four times a year, and keeping that fan base fed. There's a lot to be said for that concept. If you're only getting 99 cents for it, well, it's a lot easier to sell three songs for 99 cents than it is to sell an album's worth of songs for 99 cents. Uh, if you are leveraging social media and keeping that pumped and primed, and you're keeping your fan base interest going with that uh, with that short release, it's just the nature of the beast. It was it one once upon a time the album was people don't sit in one place and listen to an album as a cohesive whole. You don't hear a lot of Dark Side of the Moon theme type albums being put out these days and most people have two or three songs on an album that they don't appreciate so they're it's just it's a different kind of a living listening experience it's a portable it's driven by convenience even those of us who grew up on albums and love albums are maybe going to put four or five in rotation on on if i don't have 400 in rotation on a on a portable device uh, but I'm not going to sit and listen to just one album all the way through. And even then, they may all be on there, but I may skip four or five songs. So I, I think we are moving to a single-driven economy again. There's not a, um, as we move towards downloads, that facilitates that even more because you're not buying physical media. So. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay, here are a couple from Twitter that are kind of related. What was your first job in audio? What was the moment that made you realize sound would be such an important part of your life? Wow. We'll go to the we'll go to the back side of that first. It's like when did I okay. decide that I could so I took a couple of electronics classes in high school. I was my dad was military, we we're on Okinawa, there's a marine gunny sergeant teaching electronics at our high school. And uh, and got a little bit of a background from from that for the electronics side of it. And I was a very average guitar player. I say uh, I say now it's like there are people who shred, I shrek which means that like when I play, the neighbors come with pitchforks and torches. But, um, and I was 18 and so was Al Miola playing with Chick Corea and so was Michael Jackson releasing albums that it's like, you know, maybe I need to figure out some other way to get involved <laughs> with, with, with music and electronics kind of was a natural thing. I had Craig Anderton's books and was building guitar effects and stuff from them at the time based on the electronics I had in high school. So that really started with that. My first job that's really, really was audio. I worked in the, I, I went in the military myself for four years, got some training, got some credits I could go use for college, studied radio, TV, production and my first job in audio was really um, as a radio station engineer and I was responsible for everything from microphone to the transmitter but that first three quarters of that process was audio so that was where I got the real start everything in in, in the military all we cared about was 300 hertz to three kilohertz and it's kind of like you know voice band much beyond that didn't didn't matter a whole lot so we've gradually expended that <laughs> over years so expanded my bandwidth yeah oh nice um, Question? Good evening. And, okay, it's not a question exactly, but there is a theory uh, about internet and new media that when you put yourself on the internet, you're developing a second, third, or fourth self. So I myself right now, I am doing my performance as myself, but online I'm doing something else. If I'm gaming, I will be someone else. If I'm working, I will be like my second self or my third self. So I've been thinking that might be happening because I'm transporting myself through the internet. But what happened with audio? I have this theory that is, I name it 
authenticity. And I think is that uh, because we are always changing our minds about what we are listening to, we are developing ourselves through that way of expressing our audio relationship with the world. So I don't know if you get any ideas or tips for me to keep uh, thinking about the way of audiences are behaving right now. For instance, radio online, it's giving you options, right? So I said, I like Pink Floyd, and I go to Pandora, and I Google, or, well, I just played something from uh, Pink Floyd, and then Pandora starts giving me ideas and things that are similar. But at some point, Pandora is developing my personality as a user, but it's not giving me really options, because I might like something else, but I don't see it there, because Pandora doesn't think that it fits me. So uh, it's really complex. Yeah. <laughs> but do you have any thoughts about that, like audio personality, like audience interaction? And stating your personality as as your preferences and such. And, and I think most of us are more complex than the models are able to accommodate right now. I mean, you go to Rhapsody and you sign up for the things you like. But I like, a, there's a bunch of weird junk in my playlist, you know, and, 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 and most people wouldn't lump them together, but I'm really kind of fine from going to, from one of them to the other. And Rhapsody or something wouldn't take me there. So uh, I, I think the models expressing the complexity, maybe you have two or three identities online as a listener because that's the only way you're actually going to be fed by the models that exist right now. It would be interesting if we could get a, get a model that would actually predict truly everything I'm going to like, and I'd, I'd love for that to be introducing music to me now. But, but it is still very useful to go online and say, I like this, this, and this. Play me something new. And, and discover that, or just go to iTunes and download all the free stuff that they want to give you for a month, and then just put make a playlist to that and see if you can discover anything new and fun, and and maybe drive that back to your Rhapsody choices and stuff and open your horizons again. All right, cool, thank you. Uh, okay, here's one from online. Digital audio networking, how far away are we from a standard? Well, the good thing about standards and audio is that there's so many to choose from. Is the old oh, yeah. is the old line, um, and there's a lot of standards out there. For digital audio networking, the manufacturers in general are still embracing proprietary standards within certain areas. Uh, certain manufacturers are saying we can control what we're doing. We can control. Um, the way this is performing by building a network that works on our background. There haven't been a lot of um, open standards until now. Now, AVB is being touted as the next generation of, uh, of networking standards for audio video, and that goes everything from live sound to studio to, to whatever. Every application can be used for, uh, can be addressed by AVB. It's been a little slow to get into the marketplace. Uh, there are some devices working on AVB now, but the standard is not completely finalized, and until it is, some folks are not embracing uh, it quite yet. I mean, I think we're probably a year or two away. Another commercial venture is Dante, and Dante, if you went to the Infocom show, which is installed sound um, infrastructure systems around, say, a hotel, a restaurant, around a, uh, a church, a, uh, a nightclub, Dante was in a hundred. They're in more than a hundred products now. And if you look around the, that Infocom show, Dante was fairly ubiquitous. Are they a standard that everybody is going to embrace? Well, no. There's still some other guys that have some proprietary standards. But here's what AES does for you too. And AES has uh, a standards organization that makes a, uh, a a number of standards and various things. The MADI standard that's being used by a lot of folks for audio networking now was created in 92, I believe, and it's still vital and it's still being embraced today uh, and released about a week ago at, uh, from the AES's AS67. And what AS67 is is a standard for standards for interoperability. So it's, it is a standard that defines a way that people who choose to still use proprietary networks can still talk to other devices that are using proprietary networks. And maybe that's a first step towards a, common, a commonality of a standard. But there, uh, the, the AS Standards Manager, Bruce, Bruce Olson, at the, from their celebration party of AS67 the other night said, 
we've got four or five manufacturers that are already implementing AS67 as a way for devices to talk together. So, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, another one from uh, Twitter. Could the idea of the cloud destroy copyright? It hasn't already. Uh, oh, wait. <laughs> I, if people want to steal stuff, they're, they're going to steal stuff. And the, the one thing about the Internet is it's made it easier for people to steal stuff. So there's a lot of people stealing stuff. The people in this room and the people selling stuff and people working in this environment are the ones that are really suffering from that, along with the performing artists. I mean, it's... It's a sad state of affairs that that people think that they have a right to the work that someone else did and, and their livelihood. And it's had an enormous impact on the amount of money coming into this system. And it's, it's rocked recording in particular uh, uh, significantly. Can the cloud, well, it's not the cloud is the cloud, but the Internet and open access and free stuff is is making it easier to to violate copyright hopefully we can get past that and and some of its education educating people that that piracy is 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 stealing and uh you know the the if if you like a piece of music the guy that made it probably deserves something rather than your hoorah you know? all right uh question from the crowd we're running out of time, so maybe one more question, if anybody's got one. No? Oh. You have another one? Okay, we just have a little bit of time. Uh, this one is about, what do you think about uh, on over-the-air radio? Because okay. the internet is taking so much audience, what are your thoughts about the future of over-the-air FM and AM signals? Yeah, I got my start in broadcast, and as long in if we get to the point to where the infrastructure in the company with the bandwidth that the FCC is ripping away from wireless microphone manufacturers and television broadcasters, but if, we, if that bandwidth takes us to the point to where we have ubiquitous internet and as we're already moving towards as cars have internet appliances in them that can play streaming, um, streaming over the air, I think, yeah, we could see a future where, where radio disappears. Right now, it's, it's not going anywhere. Radio's demise has been predicted so many times by so many wrong people. And uh, it's, it, it would be very premature of anyone to say radio's going to die because they found a way to reinvent themselves many, many times over the year. And right now, it's still the most portable way that you can, that you can take, it, take a music source with you. But as as IP delivered streaming audio becomes something that you can suck out of the ether in your car primarily uh, in your in your portable listening device that you're carrying around 10 years from now well yeah radios radios are likely to be either reinvented itself or be gone but I'm not going to be the one to say it's going to be gone because that's that's been done too many times by too many people with egg on their faces all right okay it is uh, 3:30. And uh, so that's it. So let's uh, give a big hand for Frank Wells, president of the AES organization. And I've got a bag to give away. And a big hand for Audio Technica because we like oh, them a lot. And this mic makes me sound wonderful. How's everyone doing tonight?